For Hype Plus, I'm Terrence Sims. Insecure and Living Color, Blackish, Fresh Prince of Bel Air, Sister Sister, The Jamie Foxx Show. The 90s were met with the influx of black sitcoms that will forever have a hold on the culture to mold generations to come. These shows go on to showcase the talent of charismatic stars like Will Smith, Issa Rae, and Jamie Foxx. In the past 30 years, there have been one name to reign supreme through the genre of comedy that helped shape the voice and production of urban comedy. That name is Larry Wilmore. A man who is seldom seen, but presence often felt over some of the iconic shows like In Living Color, The Bernie Mac Show, and The Office. Larry Wilmore ushered in a new age of black sitcoms, mentoring a new generation of funny black women, and even had the audacity to call the then President Obama his nig. Did it, man. Shut your mouth. I'm just talking about Larry Wilmore. Larry Wilmore is a trailblazer who needs to be recognized not only for his comedic genius behind some of our favorite sitcoms, but also the resilience to continue forward, despite pushback from studio executives and fellow peers. Here's a look at the momentous career of Larry Wilmore. Born Elister Larry Wilmore in Pomona, California. According to Larry, growing up, Pomona was a very black middle class place when my parents first moved there. The oldest of six children, Larry and his brother would work on their comedic chops at home while attempting to drown out their parents fighting. While in high school, Larry found his escape by playing basketball, quickly realizing that being Kareem was merely a dream. An elite athlete required more than he possessed. Larry then decided to steer his focus into theater. Still in high school, Larry tried his hands at stand-up comedy at an LA comedy club. Wilmore describes, I went up on stage and I had memorized some little routine from an old comedy record. Just did impressions and I got big laughs. I don't know if people knew what I was doing, but they called me back and said, that was great. We want you to come back and showcase for the owner. The moment would not last long as Larry returned to audition with the same material, failing to replicate the same effect on the audience. It was here Larry got his first taste of jokes falling flat in a non-responsive crowd. Wilmer briefly attended college before dropping out to pursue acting and stand-up. Larry returned to stand-up comedy, writing obsessively to master the craft, but then two years began to headline clubs. During this run, Wilmer would consistently be typecast in auditions for roles that just did not appeal to him or his comedic stylings. Despite black sitcoms like The Jeffersons, Good Times, and The Cosby Show, Hollywood still had a long history with typecasting black American men as drug dealers, pimps, or gangsters. Wilmer stopped acting and in 1990, Larry got his first break at writing for Late Night Talk Show. The gig lasted six months, long enough to gain experience to land another writing job. This time, for sketch comedy show that no one had ever seen before, In Living Color from 1991 to 1994. In Living Color, a sketch comedy TV series created by Keenan Ivory Wayans, lasted five seasons and brought the comedic talents of Jim Carrey, Damon Wayans, David Allegrier straight to the living room. This inspired Larry to move forward in his career with the resolve to lead the projects he worked and tell the stories he wanted. Wilmer went on to state, so Keenan was controlling the narrative. That was very powerful to me, and that time that Keenan did the show he wanted to do, and when he couldn't do it, he left. By 1994, a seasoned writer and stand-up comedian, Wilmer briefly wrote for a series about twins who were separated at birth, then later reconnected otherwise known as Sister Sister before working alongside Quincy Jones and Will Smith for the culture staple show, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Much like when he tried his chops at stand-up comedy, Larry was met with the colder side of the business, citing irreconcilable differences with the show's producers and writers. I remember going up to Will Smith and I said, it's nothing against you, man. This is before he did Men in Black and everything. I was like, you're about to blow up, but I can't work with your boy, man. I gotta bounce out of here. There were some writers on Fresh Prince who had a little bit of that bullshit. Those are the only two shows where I felt that. But I was determined to do more of what Keenan was doing. No mother I'm going to determine the tone in this thing. It was this fierce determination to be able to have the same type of creative control and freedom of Keenan Ivory Wayans that would ultimately raise Larry Wilmore to change history for black writers everywhere. By 1996, Larry continued his juggernaut stride in entertainment, joining the Jamie Foxx show. Good job, Larry. Before coming to a realization that he wanted to create a show that could be just as smart and sophisticated as other shows on television like Seinfeld. Larry wanted to showcase black people in an authentic light as well as coming off smart. In 1999, Wilmore created the PJ starring Eddie Murphy, featuring the voices from acclaimed actors like Loretta Devine, Jennifer Lewis, Jeanette Dubois, an animated stop-motion black sitcom following the life of the tenants in the public housing and the superintendent in their lives. The show was praised for the art direction, 
but was met with disparaging remarks from creatives like Spike Lee over the stereotypes of the characters. Spike referred to the PJs as hateful towards black people, very demeaning, shows no love at all for black people. At the time, a Los Angeles-based group called Project Islamic Hope attempted to boycott the show at Fox, but it never came to fruition. Wilmer responded, I disagree with the premise. PJs is a satire, so we're shining a light on social situations, social interactions. Whether it's something we agree or disagree with, it is what it is. I mean, we had a crackhead on the show. Regardless of how critics felt, the PJs went on to win five out of eight Emmy nominations, eventually being canceled in 2001. A decade of experience, Larry was far from finished. Larry's determination to create a show like Seinfeld on his own terms remained the goal. Searching for a new way to tell stories and inspirations from French wave films, Larry would go on to create a show that was innovative in its production, showcasing the legendary talents of Bernie Mac with The Bernie Mac Show. The show was an immediate success and went on to make history with Larry Wilmore being the first black TV writer to win an Emmy. But wait, there's more. The Bernie Mac Show also earned Larry a Peabody Award, NAACP Image Award, Teen Choice Award, TCA Award Humanitas Prize, years of working alongside strict schedules, poor leadership, inspiring work ethics, a multitude of black superstar talent, Hollywood had fully opened the doors to Larry Wilmore. In an interview with Vulture, Wilmer went into detail on how he got wind of the head of Fox really felt about him. In the bathroom one day, the head of Fox at the time, Sandy Grusho, told my mole, well, I guess we can't fire him now. It's good to have friends in high places or at least in executive restroom stalls. Not only was Wilmore having issues with the head of Fox, he felt as if Bernie also turned his nose towards him. Bernie and our relationship soured, unfortunately, after I won the Emmy. I think that was his demons just at work there. Those personal demons that he had, and that was unfortunate because, I mean, I love the guy. You know, I was not trying to be in the spotlight at all, you know. I think he had the feeling that something was stolen from him. However, in a 2003 interview with TV Guide, Bernie Mac will go on to break his silence over the firing of Larry Wilmore. Battles have been going on for a long time, but the situation with Larry was something that he chose to do too. Larry was an instrumental part of the Bernie Mac show. Possibly Larry expected Bernie to be more vocal against Fox Studio executives' creative restrictions as they were crafting their own destinies. Being true to the creative spirit, and Bernie Mac just wanted to secure the bag. Who can be mad at that? Twice, Larry Wilmore has stuck to his guns, and twice, his shows were met with resistance from either public opinion or studio executives. After the Bernie Mac show, Larry would go on to produce for Whoopi Goldberg talk show Whoopi from 2003 to 2004, then writer and consultant producer for the mega hit The Office from 2005 to 2007. From 2006 to 2015, Woolmore would research with creativity for writing and performing again as a senior black correspondent for The Daily Show. Hired by Jon Stewart, Larry's segment centered around observations of the black experience in America. More bias against black people? Oh no, black people, we were so close. Larry marveled audiences with his wit and delivery on The Daily Show, while also serving as executive producer on Kenya Barris' Blackish from 2014 to 2015. John enjoyed Larry's wit and humor enough to eventually go on to produce a new late night talk show to replace Stephen Colbert in 2015. The Nightly Show introduced audience to a new form of black late night with in-depth discussions on the state of the country, predictions on Trump winning the election, also introduced one of his mentees and creator of black lady sketch show, Robin Thede. Wilmore appointed Robin head writer for the first season and a half, making Robin the first black woman to hold the position on any late night talk show. The show integrated politics and hip hop with segments like Two Chains Explains and Resident Blackhead with Felonious Monk. The Nightly Show managed to find a little following in its early first season. However, just like at Fox, Wilmore did not have the full support of network executives and was soon canceled. Sure, being fired from two of your shows would be crushing to anybody, but not Larry. Larry continued to boss up by mentoring awkward black girl, Issa Rae, to co-create the HBO hit, Insecure, was the guest speaker at the 2016 White House Correspondent Dinner, where he ruffled the fur of Wolf Blitzer and shocked the nation by being the first to graduate President Obama by calling him his nit. Never mind, just YouTube it. In a 2020 interview with Desus and Merrill, Larry stated, for me, I always wanted to have something private, made public, and I wanted to own that rather than cause people to say you don't put all of that on the street, but right now, we own the street. So I wanted that to be out. We're gonna have a private moment in front of all of you motherfuckers right now. 
In an industry that generally typecasts black artists, limited the amount of executive positions available as showrunners and writers, it is amazing that anyone would dare make a stance to do things their own way. Larry Wilmore stated, us controlling the narrative is different than when the white executives are giving it their check mark. There was nobody saying, Kenan, that's too black. You can't do that. That was a revolutionary act. There are more blacks in the decision-making process now who get to say, yeah, you can do that kind of story. That's fine. Currently, Larry is executive producer of Grownish and has five projects in development, one being with Abbott Elementary creator Quinta Brunson. Larry's 30-year legacy has been tested, weighed, tried, and not once has he ever been left wanting. Stay up to date with the latest news in comedy by subscribing here to our YouTube channel. Follow Comedy Hype across all social media and look out for original content on our new streaming service at ComedyHype.com. For Hype Plus, I'm Terrence Sims.